On this episode of Fee-Based Financial Planning Mastery, I'm going to address a lot of common questions I've been getting from listeners that deal specifically with setting fees, marketing, and your financial planning deliverables. Running a successful fee-based financial planning business is tough, and escaping the shackles of a commission-based financial planning practice is terrifying. When all you want to do is learn from those who know, learn from financial planners who are there on the front lines doing it each and every day. What if you could just open their kimono and take a look inside to learn what works and what doesn't? Now there's a place where the secrets to running a fee-based financial planning business are revealed to those who believe. Fee-based financial planning mastery. Ease your mind. Hi everyone, it's Scott Plaskett here and thanks for joining me. In this podcast, you will learn what's working and what's not in the world of fee-based financial planning. In each episode, I'm going to open my kimono and let you take an insider's look at what's working and what's not in my practice to help you take your business to the next level. I've been a fee-based certified financial planner since the early 90s, so believe me, I know the challenges you're facing. So get ready to learn not from a teacher, coach, or guru but from a colleague who's on the front lines just like you. And I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my email internet newsletter to get the most up-to-date tips on how to build and grow your fee-based financial planning practice by going to fee-based-financial-planning-mastery.com. Hey, everybody. I want to just talk about a little bit of uh, what's new with me just to give you an update on where things are at on my end. Now, um... I read one of the best books I have ever read, and the title of the book is called The Pumpkin Plan, A Simple Strategy to Grow a Remarkable Business in Any Field. Now, the author is Mike Michalowicz, and I first came across Mike through his first book called The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. This is another gem. If you're just starting your business, this book is just a, a great, inspiring book of actual practical you know, ways of of just getting anything done from a startup phase. Now, The Pumpkin Plan, however, was a book that I was looking for that would allow me to see what I needed to do next to take my business to the next level. So as a result of reading this book, uh, or should I say listening to the book, because I tend to be in the car a lot, so audiobooks are a great, uh, I, I use them all the time. I am really a busy boy right now. This book has really inspired me to do a lot and really to look at my business again. Uh, and constantly, you know, you're constantly reinventing your business when you're, when you're building it and making it as a, an extension of you. And you're always finding new things that you can be incorporating into it, uh, and putting into your business. And this is one of the reasons, uh, that I think that it, it, there's no risk in sort of telling everybody what I'm doing in my business because I'm constantly looking forward. I'm constantly looking for, for uh, you know, adding value and enhancing things, but I'm also wanting to make sure that we've got the foundation put in place. And so if I can help people put that foundation in place, um, you know, it's just going to allow them to, them and you, if you're, if this is the, uh, that we are in, into right now is re- redesigning your business, it'll just simply allow you to build that foundation that you, or to, to build upon a foundation that makes a lot of sense and will, will give you that solid base uh, that you need in order to move forward. Uh, and then as a result, it's going to start to morph into being a business that is more about y- an extension of you. Uh, and that's what makes you makes your business and you so unique. And so you're never really going to have competitors uh, with regards to that because it's always going to be an extension of you. Now, the book is laid out in such a way that it becomes your guide on exactly what you need to do to get to the next level, whatever that may be for you. And so it, it does ask you to, you know, sort of look introspectively and ask yourself, what is it you want to accomplish? And another tool that you can use that will help you, let on, help you out quite a bit on this is the V2 Mom, which I've talked about in a previous episode. And as well, there's a, a great post on our website that you can turn to uh, to help you walk through the V2 Mom. And just to give you some clarity on uh, on what it is you're, you're hoping to, to achieve and accomplish and grow and build. Now, I've put a link to the show notes uh, for this book or link in the show notes for this book uh, on my recommended reading list. So check it out. I mean, it's just a fantastic book. You can order it via a... um, uh an audiobook or a Kindle or, you know, an actual paper copy. I've actually uh, got a copy that was signed by Mike himself. uh, And I'm uh, anyways, I think it just is a fantastic book. And when you go, when you start going through it and you really get where he's coming from with regards to the pumpkin plan, and there's that great, it's a great analogy that he uses for uh, uh, building a, a thriving, growing 
you know, tremendously successful business. Um, you, it'll make a lot of sense to you. And I think it will really help in you building, uh, building your business going forward. Now, now, something else that we've done. Have you ever seen Cirque du Soleil? Uh, my wife, Kathy, and I went to see the, the latest one in our area anyways, called Amaluna. Now, it was awesome, but not for the reasons that you might think. You see, it, it was awesome to me because it wasn't perfect. You see, during the performance, there were, you know, there were some balls dropped, there were some landings missed, and a few stumbles along the way. But the thing that was amazing to me was that nobody missed a beat. This is what truly uh, made it made it incredible for me because, you know, it made the feats that they did stick, you know, the ones that they landed perfectly and everything that much more impressive because the fumbles along the way proved one thing to me. And what it proved was that they were human. And any human that can balance themselves on one arm while holding themselves up on the top of a pole and rotate themselves in a circle while in the splits is truly amazing. Amazing because they also drop balls along the way. They're human, which is inspiring because it helps me realize that as a human, I can do it if I put enough time and effort into it. It sort of reminds me of the, I don't know if you remember the four minute mile. It wasn't until 1954 that the four minute mile got broken. Uh, May 6th, 1954, it was broken by Roger Bannister. And up until that point, nobody had broken the four minute mile. Two months after Roger did it, it was broken two more times and just continues to be broken all because people realized it was then doable. All it takes is one person to do something which other people thought was impossible, and then all of a sudden it becomes doable, and then it becomes uh, you know something that can be replicated over and over and over. And that's exactly an example of that with the four-minute mile. Up until 1954, nobody had done it. I mean, this isn't that long ago. Then all of a sudden, one person does it, and then two months later, two more people do it in competition. So, um, you know, if you're... I, I, I equate this to you know, financial planning and building a financial planning business, you can spend the time mapping out exactly how you want your business to grow and unfold, but I guarantee it will not happen the way you think, which is why I'm so adamant about failing forward. You know, I've talked about that in previous episodes, but failing forward is so important. I know that nothing will work out as planned, but you can fail and not miss a beat and be better for it. My entire business is a comedy of errors. Nobody ever told me how I should build my business. My business wasn't modeled after a competitor's. My business was created as an extension of me. But my ideas were all stimulated by other businesses built by some of my mentors. The, you know, the Dan Sullivans of the world, the Mike Michalowiczs of the world, the Dan Kennedys of the world. None of these bad boys are financial planners, but they're all successful entrepreneurs. So I do wish I had someone like me to model my business after because it would have shortened the time it has taken me to get to where I am today. And this is why I hope what I'm doing for you, helping you shorten, you know, shortcut to your success. So I really hope it's helping. I really hope that this is, this to me is sort of my way that if if I, if I could start again, I would look for somebody like myself who's done it. And I would just simply build, uh, build based on their model. So I'm hoping that that's what this, this, this podcast and the, the website that we've put together is all about. I hope, hopefully it's helping you in, the, in, uh, in, in building your business. So, you know, I ask one thing of you, you know, please let me know what you need and I'll do what I can to help. So if you have any questions along the way, just send me an email and I'll either answer you directly or I'll try and answer, the, uh, answer it on uh, uh, on, a, on an episode uh, and hopefully give you as much information as I can. And if I can't answer it immediately, I'll find the answer for you or I'll find somebody who can answer it for you. So anyways, um, let me know what you need. Hopefully this is helping uh, from the responses I've been getting from people, uh, you know, ever since we started this. Uh, it's just been fantastic and getting just such wonderful feedback, wonderful emails, and uh, I can't thank you all enough. So if you have any questions for me, just feel free to ask and I'll do what I can to get back to you. Thanks. And now for our feature segment. To those of you who responded to my email asking asking you what one of your frustrations or what your biggest frustration was, I want to thank you. We had a tremendous, or I had a tremendous response from that email. And, uh, you know, the email that basically said, what's your one frustration that's holding you back from migrating to a fee-based financial planning model? Uh, I had no idea that I was going to get that many responses. And, um... There was a bit of a common theme that came from all of the responses. So what I wanted to do in this episode was cover, uh, cover those common themes and just see if I can answer uh, a lot of the questions that were coming from that. And so I'll, uh, I'll go through and 
and, and, you know, just deal with one, each one at a time, each one of the common themes. Now, the first area I want to work through deals with setting your fees. And this was one that was probably the most popular. How do I set my fees? What do I charge? Uh, I don't know what my competitors are charging. I don't know who my competitors are. I don't know how to find out what they're charging. Now, here are some of the responses uh, and questions that I received around this topic. So we're going to start off with uh, Gail from Canada wrote that she either charged a flat fee for clients who only want uh, a plan or she charged a percentage of assets under management for those who want to invest with her. Now, I love that she's charging a flat fee for the planning, but I would encourage everyone to charge a flat fee even if the client invests. You see, operating in a rebate type of environment devalues the comprehensive financial planning services that you provide. I do like... Uh, that all of the fees are being disclosed, you know, when you're, you know, transparency is awesome when you're saying I'm going to charge you percentage of, percentage of assets and then it's charged to the account. That's great. But let's not devalue the planning services by giving them away for free. What the client sees in this scenario is that all you really care about is managing the investments. Focus on operating your business in kind of uh, two divisions. You know, there's two different silos, so to speak. There's a financial planning silo, uh, and then there's an implementation silo. So implement, so planning is division one, implementation is division two. So if you're operating like this, give this a try. On the next client you take on, simply tell them what the fee is for the planning services and provide them with an awesome financial planning experience. Then when it comes time to discuss the fees on the investment implementation and oversight, simply tell them the, what the total fee is to move on their, uh, you know, to move forward uh, with that part of their plan. And, you know, there's no, no even discussion, no, no discussion about rebating based on the financial planning. So don't try and sell the investments up front. Don't even get involved with the investments up front because you have no idea what the, the, uh, uh, what, which investments are appropriate. I mean, this model places tremendous value on financial planning, which is where the heavy lifting takes place. And as the, the great Joe Polish says, when people pay, they pay attention. So clients place more value on something they pay for. So again, focus on when you're, you know, I, I was, I had a phone call with, uh, with one of our listeners the other day. And uh, I said to him, listen, you know, you're, you're talking too much about the investments up front. You're talking too much about the implementation. Don't even go near the implementation. Your discussions up front should be strictly on financial planning. Uh, and that's why I encourage people to tell people, don't bring anything with you to the first meeting. Let's just have a conversation about overall financial planning first and then deal with the financial plan side so we can then develop the appropriate plan in order to, deter to, to lead us to what are the most appropriate implementation uh, solutions going forward forward but we won't we won't know what those are until we do the plan first so let's not even talk about financial about investments let's talk about financial planning first now gerard from ireland wrote that people were not used to paying for paying uh, for advice in Ireland. And, and uh, now for those of you who have been listening to all of my episodes, you may recall uh, Gerard is one of those what I call doers. He went out there and charged his first fee and had a fantastic response from his client. However, the question then becomes, are you charging enough? Okay, so um, people first of all need to be educated on how they were paying for the advice all along. So if you follow the fee presentation methodology I went through in a previous episode, you'll most likely not have any resistance to the fee as it's purely logical for you to be charging for uh, charging a fee for the financial planning services. So when you place the, an emphasis on finding out what a prospective client's true issues and concerns are by asking them lots of questions that pertain to all of the areas of financial planning. So the things like retirement planning, investment planning, education, uh, insurance, tax, estate, business, hopes, dreams, desires, all those things, you get a very clear understanding for what their motivations are. Then when you show them that you, that, that you have a financial planning process that will not only provide them with all of their options, the pros and cons to each option, a roadmap that shows them what they're on track for and the knowledge that you will be that that you'll be reviewing their progress along the way to ensure that they stay on track it's totally illogical and puzzling to them if you don't charge for that service so how do you know if you're charging enough 
Well, first of all, you need to place in front of you a, a completed financial plan so you can take a look at what your own deliverable is, all right? Then take a close look at how much time goes into the pre-meeting setup. Now, what I'm going to go through now is really just a way of getting to a number. And I'm not saying it's the right number, but I'm just going to talk about how to get to a number, which is really where we need to start from. So take a close look at how much time goes into the pre-meeting setup, the actual meeting, the post-meeting follow-up, the plan writing, and then the deliverable costs. So everything that goes into putting that document together, add it all up. How many hours did it take you to prepare, on average, a client's complete comprehensive financial plan? Now, I would venture to guess that when you add it all up, it will take you at least six hours for all of this, probably more like eight to 10 hours. So what do other professionals in your market, like lawyers and accountants, charge for an hour of their time? Is it $100 an hour, 200 400 I don't know. But let's use, for an example, let's use $200 an hour. So $200 an hour at six hours is $1,200. So there's a starting point. So that covers the costs of the initial plan. But don't forget that in the first year, you'll probably have at least one, but probably two review meetings on top of all the meetings that go into the financial planning. So considering that each meeting has a pre-meeting, meeting and post meeting work you're probably looking at another 3 to 5 hours of time another 600 to to 1000 dollars so all in you can say let's let's just choose the number let's call it 2000 dollars that's where i'd start for an initial plan okay so if you're putting together initial comprehensive financial planning i would start with a base plan being a $2,000 fee for the first 12 months of everything that goes into that. Now, annually, I would then charge 40 to 50% of the, of the initial plan fee for the annual monitoring and reviewing of that. Now, clients will need to invest somewhere, and odds are pretty good that if they're happy with the planning services, they'll basically have no issue implementing through you. If they don't implement through you, they'll have to go somewhere else. And that somewhere else means developing a relationship with somebody new, they, uh, they're going to have to find that person. They're going to have to, they, you know, but you're the person they already like. So they're going to want to start with you. And you basically say, okay, the oversight fee is a percentage of assets of the, of the, uh, of assets that we're over, overseeing charged to the account uh, as part of the annual management fee. So if the, the investment counselor portfolio manager charges 1% and you charge half percent to 1%, depending on the account size, you'll still be coming in below the industry average for mutual funds, at least in Canada anyways. And the client will be getting a ton more service and feel a ton more confident about their plan and relationship with you. So, you know, by working through you as their financial planner, you're giving them comprehensive, financial, comprehensive, unbiased financial planning because your plan is not predicated on them implementing it through you. So they have a certain sense of, of confidence that the information and advice you're giving is, uh, is really based on their needs and through the, the process that I recommend, uh, it really, really screams that you're just doing it for them and, and yeah, you know, the only thing you're going to be doing is, is charging a fee for the advice that you're giving. But then with all that, and they totally buy into the financial plan, they know they have to implement it somewhere. So you give them a choice. You say, well, you can implement it through me. And these, these are the recommendations I would have. I would recommend either this particular investment program or this invoice investment counselor or this portfolio manager. And we can go and we can meet with them. And I'll be there for all of those meetings and, and, uh, and all the oversight and all of that. And all the oversight fee, my fee for that would be, call it 1%. And again, it depends on the account size. Uh, we usually start at 1% and then we work our way down if the account size grows. So that then says that we're going to be there for not only the overall planning, but also the oversight. This relationship that you're, you're, you're creating with you with this prospective client and this client is like nothing else. They trust you implicitly because your plan is based on their goals and their best interest. And 100% of the fees you charge for your planning and oversight are completely transparent. People don't mind paying for value. People are paying more for this with their mutual fund portfolios and getting a fraction of the value. They don't trust their advisor because they don't know how much the advisor is really getting paid, so they never know if the solution being presented to them is in their best interest or the advisor's best interest. So having that full disclosure model, uh, you know, I've given you sort of a way of starting. I've said in the past that sort of you don't want to start I wouldn't put anything less than $2,000, and I'm talking $2,000 Canadian dollars, uh, so you may want to adjust that for your particular market. But that's where I would start. Um, and 
as the complexity of the plan increases, then you just simply create, uh, you know, you create a program. And if you see on our website, we've got our sort of, we've got three programs. We've got a basic program, a mid-level program for people who have, you know, completely paid off their debts and are really getting aggressive about uh, wealth accumulation. And then we've got more of a wealth preservation plan. Uh, and each of those carries with it a different financial planning fee. Uh, and then the implementation for each one is, is similar depending on the asset size. Uh, so make sure that everything is fully disclosed. And, you know, people don't mind having the conversation. They actually embrace the conversation because it finally puts all the cards on the table. And now there's no, there's no mystery to the whole thing. So hopefully that helps uh, Gerard and anybody else that's sort of wondering where do I start and what's the, what type of fees do I charge? I would start there. Uh, and remember, the first thing is all you need to do is get out there and charge your first fee, present that first fee. And if you go back to some of the previous episodes, uh, there's one particular episode, I can't remember the exact number, uh, but one of the previous episodes goes through the exact process that I go through and some of the scripting and, and how I would uh, how I would go through the presentation of the fee. Uh, so go back and listen to one of those and you'll, uh, you know, hopefully that'll give you a, a framework or a uh, you know, a track to run on when it comes to you sitting down and presenting your first fee, which I tell you can be a very uncomfortable experience, we'll say. Uh, charging your first fee, it's more scary to you. You'll find that once you've done it, the, the client, it, you know, they're ready for it and they're expecting it. Uh, and as I say, it's almost illogical when you don't charge a fee for the, uh, for the financial planning services because of all the work that goes into it. Now, uh, Tim from the UK shared a lot of what Gail and Gerard wrote and also wanted to know more about benchmarking against your competitors as well as marketing strategies. So bottom line is this, you don't have any competitors. You see, going this model, going in a fee-based route, you just simply won't have very many competitors, if if any. I say this because the goal of developing your own fee-based financial planning firm is to create a unique process that you own. And when you own it, nobody else can offer it and you can charge what it is truly worth. Everyone brings a certain uniqueness to their planning. Everybody does it a little bit differently. You know, their demeanor is different. Their creative solutions are different. Their ability to quickly uh, build rapport and trust is different. They've got unique deliverables. Everything is unique to what it is that you do because this is where you're not provide, you're not delivering somebody else's product. You're delivering your product. Your product is your service. And I talk about, and I've talked about it before, about productizing your service and turning your service into a product so that you have your own unique deliverable. And that's so important because by doing that, nobody else can compete with you. So when I say you don't have any competitors, I truly mean that. Now, it's an evolutionary process. Heck, I'm still enhancing our unique process and I don't think I'll ever stop because this is what allows you to keep up with what's happening in the marketplace and the, the different direction that, uh, that the marketplace is wanting you to go. And if you keep on asking your clients, what more are you looking for? What more are you looking for? And they keep on giving you some honest answers. You can just simply direct your deliverable and services towards uh, providing exactly it is what they're looking for. Don't be afraid to ask your clients. They're more than willing to help. And if you position it in such a way that you say, listen, I'm just simply wanting to make sure that we're, we're constantly delivering exactly what it is you're, you hope, you're hoping you're placing value on. Is there anything else that you feel that we could deliver or that you would like to have delivered uh, that would be meaningful, that would be valuable to you? And then just let them speak. Um, so don't be afraid to ask that question. So now the, the, the understanding that it's an evolutionary process is important because it oftentimes, um, you know, you know, well, let's put it this way. I have a lot of times I have people say to me, well, what if somebody copies your process, right? And, you know, we've got our process. It's all sort of online. Uh, I say to them because, uh, you know, basically my response is we'll let them. I mean, because they can try and copy my process because what they're seeing today is an old version of what's coming out tomorrow. You see, it's an evolutionary process. And so as we keep on going, as I keep on growing my practice, I'm constantly enhancing things, which I've talked about. And so nobody will, you know, unless you're a client and you're there every meeting along uh, along the way and sort of listening into that, you're never going to know exactly what my latest iteration is, what my latest solution uh, uh, is and that sort of thing. So, you know, don't be afraid of, uh, of people seeing what you're doing because the reality is most people aren't going to even step up and do it. And they're going to look at it and go, well, they may not even see the value in it because they're not getting it from a from a uh, from the whole methodology process that goes way back to the starting point of why you're creating the business in the first place. So, your marketing efforts 
if you follow my education marketing approach, we'll set you apart from your competitors. And you know, your competitors just won't get what you're doing. They won't understand how it is you're doing what you're doing. And they, won't, they just won't understand it. So again, it comes back to you don't have any competitors. So here's what you do when it comes to, you know, it comes to a marketing standpoint. Offer great content that answers people's most burning questions to build rapport with them well before you ever meet with them. In essence, you want people pre-sold on your services before they meet with you. And this is done through your lead nurturing. Okay, so I've talked about, again, automating the whole process. And this is something I am very adamant about because I don't believe in building a big, expensive, you know, uh, expensive business to run. I'm really not a fan of that. I think that, you know, a lot of these firms that have all the staff members and stuff just adds more and more pressure to uh, the ultimate, the ultimate uh, revenue generator, which is generally the financial planner. Uh, and I just don't think it makes sense to, to layer on all these costs. So I'm a real advocate of marketing and automation. And I really want to make sure that you've, you, you can embrace this as well. So you really want to automate the whole process. And so in the show notes, I'll put a link to the first step of automating your process, which is an email autoresponder. And the one I use is called AWeber. Uh, AWeber is a, it's a fantastic program that is just so easy to use. And uh, it, it integrates with all of the solutions that I recommend. And really what it's there for is to capture the, the name, and ad, name and email address of the people who are interested in the content that you're putting out there. Now, you're going to offer your content through your website. And so you need to set up your WordPress website using what I call what's called the five minute quick install. Uh, again, in the show notes, I'm going to put a link to uh, the host that we use. And we use this host for a reason. It's number one, it's a very popular host. Number two, it's a very inexpensive host. And number three, it's a host that is finely tuned to, and set up to, to work with WordPress. Um, so again, I'm going to, going to turn, put the, the show notes in the page. But again, if you've never done this before, don't think it's a big process. All you do is when you go to um, uh, set it up, so you go online, click on the uh, the setup and set up the whole process. And then once you've got it set up and you've once you've got your account and your login information, call their 1-800 number. Um, because if you can't set it up yourself, just simply call them. They've got 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, tech support, which is awesome. And have them install the, the WordPress for you. Just have them click on the, the uh, five minute install. You, you'll literally be on the phone for less than five minutes because it doesn't even take them that long. Uh, and they'll set it up for you and you'll have your basic site. And then they'll say, okay, go to www.yourdomainurl.com uh, your or whatever your, your website address is. Uh, and uh, you'll be able to uh, see your, your, your website right there. Now, you'll, you're, you're going to be the only one that knows about it at this point. And so don't worry about other people finding it because they're not going to know it exists. Um, and so, yeah, so definitely do that. If you haven't actually even got your, your, URL, your URL and your URL is the www dot your company name or whatever your website name is dot, you know, com or CA or whatever it is. If you haven't got that, then just go to one, one and one dot com. So one, the number one, A N D one dot com. And there you can, it's the cheapest place I've been able to find to uh, purchase your domain. And you just simply go there and you, there's a little box that, uh, asks you to type in the name that you're looking for and it will go check the internet and see if it's available and if it's available uh, then you say okay I'll purchase it Uh, you purchase it and then you own it from there and so it's very easy to set up Um, uh, I like to have all of my domains and all of my URLs that I've purchased in one place so you can easily manage them Uh, I do it through oneinone.com and uh, it's just because it's a very easy way of doing it everybody knows who one in one is all the uh, you know main uh, main companies know about it, and so they they can usually walk you through any t- troubleshooting that's uh, uh, that that might come up. So, really, again, you set up your uh, your domain. Once you've set up your domain, then it's going to say, okay, if somebody types in www.yourdomain.com, where do you want to point them to? And that's where you point them to the Bluehost, and Bluehost has all the pre-configured uh, address that you want to send it to. And so, when it goes to Bluehost, then it knows, okay, if it if it comes if it's looking for www.yourdomain.com. And Bluehost gets the request. It says, okay, here's the uh, request. Point it to this WordPress website and boom, you're set to go. And that's how, uh, that's how it all kind of works. So, you know, with that, you, you're, you're going to want to set up your, your autoresponder, set up your WordPress site, um, do it through Bluehost, do it through the Aweber uh, account and all the information's in the show notes. And then you want to make your site look pretty. 
And it's very, very simple to do that. No coding at all. You can just basically go to, um, on our, again, in the resources tab, you'll see the, or sorry, our toolbox tab, you're going to see our premium theme options. We use uh, a company called Woo Themes, and that's how we've, uh, we started our sites and, uh, you know, everything was done through Woo Themes. There's one called, I think it's called the Fresh News, uh, which is, pretty you know pretty robust and in, in that it allows you um you know to do quite a bit and to get a lot of different color options and and whatnot so it's a good one to start from at least um if you if you just don't know because you can get lost in all the different samples that are there and it's kind of cool because you can go on to their website and you can actually see everything you can play with the colors and stuff on their website before you actually purchase it and you purchase it for yeah i don't know what the cost is now but it's i think it's under a hundred dollars uh you get three three themes at least the one i did was i think i paid seventy dollars at the time and i got three different themes that i could choose from uh and you just sort of download them and they send you the file and then when you get that file you go to wordpress and in wordpress under your dashboard which is where you you administer everything in your um uh, in WordPress, you'll see a themes tab. And under the themes tab, it says, okay, well, what theme do you want? And it says, well, uh, if you have a new theme to upload, click upload here and you up, you click upload. It says, where's the theme located? It's on your hard drive. Cause you just downloaded it from WooThemes and you click go and it uploads it. And then you can, a little button comes up and says, do you want to activate it? You can activate it immediately. And there you go. Your entire site is all set up. Then you just simply go through answering the questions in the, uh, the theme options. It's going to ask you for the website title. It's going to ask you for any logos that you've got. If you don't have logos, just simply write in the text of what your title is and it'll put a nice font to it. Uh, what colors do you want to use? And it really just, it's just point and click and it's just so easy and it's all nice and clean it looks good and then all you have to do is just start adding content so uh, the great thing about using the autoresponder email autoresponder aweber is that it integrates with all of the wordpress themes Uh, using woo themes is great because what they do is they ensure that their themes are always kept up to date with your WordPress install, WordPress oftentimes will come out with updates and so it'll you know I'd say there's probably 50 or 60 updates that come throughout the year and you really just you click on update and it updates it. But the thing is, you need to make sure your theme can keep up with the update. Well, um, your theme, uh, WooThemes keeps keeps all the updates ready for you. So once you own the theme, you get all the future updates, uh, and you just simply click on uh, update, and everything just uh, it happens all automatically for you. So it's really really easy to use. In any event, the automating is the is the whole process. So once you've got that set up, then you need to put, or you, you got your website set up, so you've got your autoresponder, you've got your WordPress site, you've got the site looking good. Now, you need to build some content. So put a piece of content together, and then you're going to promote it. And it's super easy. When I started this, I had no idea what I was doing, to be honest with you, and simply found these great resources that pretty much did everything for me, you know, and, and these are the resources, the, the uh, Bluehost, the Aweber and WordPress uh, and WooThemes. It's sort of everything, sort of that little bundle is everything you need to get started. And then, you know, ask questions, okay? Simply ask questions. Find a mentor, become part of a mastermind group, just get out there and fail forward. The great thing is that until you start promoting your site, nobody's gonna know it's there, so you can't look foolish, okay? All of the resources I use are on the fee-based-financial-planning-mastery.com website under the toolbox. Use them. They're tested. They're what I'm currently using right now. They work. I wouldn't promote them if they didn't. So, by setting all of that up, now the methodology is you then put your um, uh, your form, which is the the lead capture form, which is the you know if you want this piece of content, um, you know, put your name and email address here, and then click uh, download or whatever, and then that takes the Aweber takes over from there, and that's where you go through the Aweber, Aweber process, and there's a wizard that walks through through everything on how to use it, and you just simply answer the questions. You say, okay, well, here's the email I want them to get to ver. Here's the wording of the email. I want them to get to verify uh, their uh, their subscription. Uh, the great thing about Aweber is that it has what's called a double opt-in, and a double opt-in is simply a way of making sure that your database is kept clean of people and their and real email addresses. So it eliminates people from putting in crappy email addresses and then still getting your content. So what it does is it says, okay, well, if I want a certain report, then I'm going to put my name and email address in. I click submit. It 
instantly comes and says, okay, one more step in order to verify um, all of your details so we can get the information right out to you, go to your inbox now and click on the, uh, the, the link that verifies your, uh, uh, your information. Instantly, they go to their inbox. The inbox, inbox uh, is, is sitting there with the email waiting for them. They click on the verification. And then by clicking on that, you've preset it up so that it instantly da- it drops them on their content page, which is where they can download the, the content that they wanted. So it all happens within a few minutes. And it's a great process because what it does is it eliminates people from putting a junk email address in, uh, and it also makes sure that the, that there's no spamming or no, you know, systems that run out there just to you know uh, to request all this information. So you've got really good real live email addresses that you can then start to nurture. And then you want to you know in setting up the form you want to ask yourself well what information do I want? Do I want their first name? Do I want their last name? Really what I would start off with probably is just getting their first uh, even just their first name and their email address. That's probably the lowest risk um, way of setting it up. You can then start if you wanted to go a little bit further you can ask for maybe their their last name uh, as well. Uh, but I wouldn't bother trying to get their either you know address and mailing address and all that sort of information. Just simply go with their first name and the email address and that should do it uh, and then you know everything else will uh, will just s- simply go from there so put your piece of content together and then you're going to start promoting it and the way you promote it is on your on your WordPress site you can create what's called a landing page and that's just simply a page where uh, you can uh, send people to and you can either do it through uh, just simply writing a post and then at the bottom of the post you can say well if you want some more information on this uh, then you know click here or you can just even have the the information being uh, made available on the home page of your website and it's if you just go to our website for example you'll see on the top right corner we've got a uh, a piece of content that's available and that's just simply so we can get uh, get the uh, 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 an email list of people who you know want to know more about that type of information and so it just allows you uh, a contact list to build and then that way you can nurture that uh, those along the way and just keep on sending them great information uh, and then you can just you know carry on from there so there's just so much to do or it's not so much to do but there's well there's so much to do but there's so much you can do with that uh, email list once you've got it because now you've got a small list of, or not and it'll grow to be a large list but you've got a list of people who have raised their hand to say I'm interested in that content and then you can sort of start to answer some of the questions that they may have Uh, as they go through your content and then just set up an autoresponder that nurtures them along. So, you know, all of the resources that I talked about are under the fee-based financial planning mastery.com website. Just go to the toolbox and uh, that should help f- help set that up. And that's really the marketing strategy that I want you to, to embrace here. Um, you know, I don't, th- I, I don't like spending a lot of money on marketing, but I do like to get an, a return that I can track. So, what you're spending in this case is simply your time at first. All it is is your time. There's a small cost for the AWeber account. I think it's for the first month it's a dollar, and then it's it's very minimal uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, the cost for your your web hosting on Bluehost is uh, is very. I think it's I think there's a special on right now actually, but I think it could be six ninety nine a month or seven ninety nine a month or something like that. So it's very inexpensive, and then um, WordPress is free. So there's no issue there, and then it's just a matter of of purchasing the URL that you want to use for that, and that I think is you know could be nine dollars or ten dollars or something like that. So a uh, very inexpensive way to do that, and then once you've got it all set up, then you can say, okay, I'm going to then promote a piece. I'm going to maybe write a piece of content, and then make make available the uh, uh, information uh, that people can find organically when they're searching online. Or if you wanted to, you could then step it up a notch, and you could then you know put a postcard together or put a flyer together or something like that that you could then distribute to a targeted area of your, you know, of your marketplace. So it could be a targeted neighborhood or something like that. And you can say, okay, I'm going to blanket this neighborhood with this piece of content. And I'm going to ask everybody with this content, who's interested in finding more about whatever your piece of content is. So it could be a piece of content that's, that, you know, talks about, um, you know, how to choose a financial planner. It could be content on how to uh, make sure your your retirement assets are properly positioned to provide you with the greatest income in, during retirement, you know, mistakes to avoid uh, when transitioning through to retirement, whatever it happens to be. Um, put that content together and then promote it through a flyer. And you just simply send out the flyer, making it available. You don't put your, um, you know, you don't, 
it's not the traditional type. You just simply offer the flyer. Uh, so you don't want to put your big logo and your big pretty face and all that sort of stuff on the content. Really, you're, you're not promoting yourself here. You're promoting the content. What, and all you want to do is promote the content so you can get the information, which is their lead, the uh, email information and name, so you can nurture those those leads along the way. It's very low risk and low threat um, type of marketing. And what it does is it blankets your marketplace. So it could be, a, as I say, a geographic region or a neighborhood. And then it says, who in this neighborhood is interested in what I am what I am talking about? And now you've narrowed the list and then you can start focusing on those people. And again, once you set it up, you can automate the whole process. Now, Andrew from the UK says he finds it hard to find clients who are prepared to pay for the financial planning services that he's, uh, he's, wanting to, he's offering. Well, the the key here is education, okay? Um, the reason why it probably feels like they're not willing to pay for it is because they just don't know what they're getting. They're just, they're, they're just seeing you probably as a, uh, you know, as a, a salesperson for investments or insurance or whatnot. So education is the key here. So what you want to do, it comes right back to the type of marketing that I talk about, which is developing content which shows shows how for the exact same service, your model is a lot less expensive and for less than what they're paying now. Your model provides them exactly with with what they felt they should have been getting in the first place. You see, you know, it's not that clients are not willing to pay. It's that clients don't know what services are available. Develop your own unique process. Name it, package it, and promote it. As soon as you do, people begin to see you as different and then you can educate them on how you're different and better. And going through the process that I've talked about in, in that education process, it's all about making them realize that it's different. So take the services that you provide. And remember, the services you provide as a fee-based financial planner are not selling investments. They're not selling insurance. The services you provide are financial planning to help people determine what the best course of action is for them to accomplish their financial goals. That's what it is that you're selling. So turn that service into a product. And I talked about it before. It's called productizing your service. So simply turn that service into a product and then promote that product. Suddenly you can now promote that product and people will see if you've got a schematic or graphic that that illustrates it. You can talk about each point in the process. You can educate them on how this process helps them get to the point of being able to make better decisions as to how to move forward and how to implement their financial plan. This is what they're paying you for. They're not paying you for your investments. They're paying you for your advice. So um, hopefully, uh, Andrew, that helps in, in clarifying some of that. And if you have any questions along the way, if I haven't answered your, your question completely, just send me an email and I will get back to you on that. Now, Mark from Canada and Barbara uh, both shared their desire to have a properly running back office system to help them manage their business. And they found that, you know, one of the challenges is managing all this, is keeping it all organized and whatnot. So this point is near and dear to my heart because I struggled with this for many, many years. And I actually did a full episode on, you know, choosing the right CRM system and what we use and all that sort of sort of thing. But I gave up the quest many years ago for having things 100% integrated. I don't think you'll ever find a solution that allows you to integrate everything 100%. You're going to have multiple solutions, but each each component is going to be for a specific reason. Now, they will probably work together well, but not, there's not going to be one solution that's going to do everything for you. So what I have found works best is this. So number one, salesforce.com to manage your core client record keeping, your core cl- calendar management, and your workflow automation. So this is sort of for the the office workings, the behind the scenes, the 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 back office, the backstage, whatever you want to call it. This is the the, the core system that's going to manage everything for you. We keep the data files for our financial planning software as an attachment to the household record in Salesforce. So all of the financial planning we do is done with a separate piece of software. And so we do all our planning with that. All the client record, client files then are, are created from that financial planning software. So what we do is, uh, and this is just because of the way our software works, we then take the data file and we save that as an attachment in our Salesforce um, database. And so what that allows us to do is we always can then go back to our, our client record in the, in the database where we actually have opportunities set up, and I'll get to that in a moment. But we go back to our, uh, 
the file in our database and we can always pull the most recent version of the plan. We can also, if we needed to, go back and take a look at previous versions of the plan so we can maybe, if a client said, listen, I want to know from day one, how have things progressed? Where did I start? Where am I today? Am I moving forward? Well, we can go back and we can say, well, plan, you know, that plan back then, this is where you were at, here's where you're at today. And so you can very easily uh, build that, uh, that, that, that sort of progress report for them. Now, um, so we, we do that with our financial planning software. So start out with the basics first, okay? There is a lot that you can bring in and a lot that you can manage and a lot of data that you can, but start out with the basics first. Keep it simple and then build on it. So every year it's going to be, again, you're going to be constantly evolving and constantly adding more and more to it as time goes on. Don't try and do everything up front. It will never work properly for you. Start it with the basics. So ask yourself, what is the key information that you need to record for each client? Okay. So number one, it's going to be start off with the tombstone information, your address, uh, contact numbers, name, rank, serial number, you know, all the basics, basic information. Then we track each different product we deliver as an opportunity in Salesforce. Now, what do I mean by product? Well, again, I've told you that the services we provide, which is the fee-based, which is the financial planning or comprehensive financial planning, we've turned that into a product or we consider that a product. So we have an opportunity for financial planning. We also have an opportunity for investments. We have an opportunity for life insurance, for living benefits, for executive compensation uh, programs like individual pension plans. And uh, if we a client needs to get a will done, then we have an opportunity for creating, for getting the will done. And then that simply allows us to track all of the different moving parts that need to be monitored for a client's financial plan. We attach all of the financial plan reports. So when we do a financial plan report, whether it be the full plan or, or a plan update or something like that, we attach those, make those as attachments to the opportunity. So we always have an electronic copy of every plan and document that we created within that opportunity. So again, if we're looking at the financial planning opportunity, then all of the, the updates and revisions and whatnot, they're all recorded as an attachment to the opportunity, and the attachment is linked to the household. So we can say, okay, for this household, what opportunities are we working on? Here's the financial plan that we're working on. Here are all the different versions of the financial plan. Here's everything we need to know in one organized fashion. We attach all of the financial plan reports, as I said, as, uh, to the opportunity. We do the same thing for the development of their investment plan and insurance plan. So if, you, if a client says, yeah, I want, to, uh, I want to find out what your recommendations would be for investments. So now we put together all of the investment recommendations are then all the reports and information that we, we recommend to them are, are saved as attachments to that opportunity. Okay, so you can see how uh, if you start at the top level, it starts with the household. Then within that household, we have individuals, and those are known as contacts. Each of those contacts or the household is can be linked to an, an opportunity. So if it's a financial plan, then that opportunity is, is uh, an opportunity which each contact gets linked to. If it's a, an opportunity for a life insurance policy for one of the contacts, then that life insurance policy gets linked to that particular contact. But if I click on the household, which is the highest level uh, in the organization, I can then see for this household, what are all the opportunities? If I then want to click on the individual, I can see what all the opportunities I'm working on for that individual are. Uh, and so you can see it just keeps it nice and organized for you. And so that just allows us to, to, to track everything in one place. Um, and that's uh, that, that we're using Salesforce for. Now, email. Uh, I do all my emailing through Google for Business. So we've created a, a business account with Google uh, and then or Google Apps or I can't remember. I think it's Google for Business. And this fully integrates with Salesforce. So all of my email correspondence is done through through a, like a Gmail account, but it's a it's a paid for uh, account. It's not the free one. I think it's fifty dollars a year. Um, and we do do it that way for a specific reason, because that allows us to sort of integrate things in the cloud in a more robust way. And then I can start to have, uh, you know, I can use my uh, my own company name as my domain, you know, so Scott Plaskett at ironshield.ca. Um, I can do all of that. Uh, and, and it doesn't show up as a Gmail account. It actually shows up as a branded account. Then I can create, if I have more people in the office that I need to create email addresses for, I can give them their own accounts and I can manage all of that in one, uh, co- one co- cohesive place. And so that's called Google for business. Uh, and it's very easy to set up. Uh, and again, it integrates completely with, with Salesforce. So if I'm in my Salesforce and I want to send a client an email, I 
can click on the email address uh, in Salesforce. It simply opens up my uh, Gmail account. I send the email and then it, it, it records a copy of that email in the, uh, in the notes section of, uh, of that contact. So I can go back to that contact and take a look at all the, the correspondence that, I'm, uh, uh, that I have with them via email. Now, for managing all of the projects, uh, and there's a lot of projects, so you can see these are projects that I'm working that basically are non-client related. So uh, it could be, you know, an example would be, you know, if you're setting up your website or if you're uh, wanting to send out a an email um, to all of your clients and an e newsletter or something like that. You're going to manage those in a different place. Um, I use Basecamp for this. It's a, it's an online service. This is probably the the best project management service available. Again, it's a cloud-based system. Uh, I think, again, I pay 50 bucks a month for, uh, for the rights to that. And then I can incorporate it, bring as many people as I want into the project. So I use Basecamp as our project management tool to keep track of all the projects I'm working on so I can always keep non-client projects moving forward. So those are, again, all my marketing campaigns, all my podcast episodes, my blog posts, anything like that. Basecamp also allows me to collaborate with everyone who's involved in a project and is the best tool I know for keeping track of all of your non-client initiatives. Uh, You can even track your financial plans through Basecamp if you wanted to, um, but I tend to keep all of my tracking done for clients through uh, Salesforce. Uh, so, but if you don't want to move to Salesforce right away, then this may be a solution for you to take advantage of. So, you know, it really works well. I, you know, we have uh, a few virtual assistants that are working with us. So these are people that work uh, for us that we that don't work out of our office. And so Basecamp allows us to keep them in the loop. So if there's a project that I'm working on with one of my VAs, then I can just include them in the project and I communicate with them back and forth through that. So I can see everything that's going on and keep everything organized. So that's a program called Basecamp. Uh, highly recommend you check that out. It's the most amazing um, uh, project management solution I've ever seen, and it just keeps everything in order. Now, every planner needs good, robust financial planning software. Now, you know, I, people are listening to this show from all over the world, so I can't really speak to software solutions outside of what I'm using in Canada here. So keep that in mind. But there are certain things that you do want to keep uh, keep in mind when putting your software together. So what I would do is, first of all, poll the market. Take a look at, for your market, what are the top software programs available? And it's not that easy or not that difficult to find. Just Google, you know, financial planning software for, you know, for me, it would be for Canadians, for U.S., for whatever it happens to be, whatever your jurisdiction is. Um, Find the financial planning software and find the top software. And, you know, oftentimes there's uh, industry journals that will do rankings on software and do comparative analysis and whatnot. So just simply find the number, all the, the, the top handful of software programs that you uh, could be using. Uh, then you want to find the software that allows you to tell a client's story in the simplest way possible. One of the things I found was that, um, you know, it was so difficult in some cases to put a plan together. And then the output was so daunting uh, in some of these planning planning programs that it was just overwhelming. And that just sort of bogged down the whole financial planning process. I ended up finding, asking myself a question, what's really important? You know, maybe it's important to have all the data that you can turn to if a client asks a detailed question, but what are the key reports that you want to look at? You know, things like, well, what's their net worth? What's their, where are they currently at today? Um, you know, what is the, what does the, the forecast look like? What are they on track for? So ask yourself, what are the key documents that you want? And take a look at the software for how well it reports on those documents and how easy it is to keep those documents up to date, because that's going to integrate That's going to become part of your review process. You know, one of the things we review at all of our uh, client review meetings is uh, is their net worth. And we take a look at all of the data that currently goes into their net worth because sometimes things happen along the way between meetings. Uh, you know, uh, debts get paid off, debts get incurred, and I'm just not aware of them until uh, we get together for review meetings. So the first step I have in my review meetings is let's just take a look at your net worth and make sure that all the information we have on our system is congruent with what's actually happening in real life. We oftentimes, you know, we'll know about a lot of the investments and, and whatnot, but what we don't have... Uh, oftentimes is if they've, you know, paid down their mortgage more aggressively. So we want to take a look at where they're at with that. So here's what I look for in a software program. Number one, easy data input. Uh, I want to be able to hand the data input over to uh, an assistant because it's very expensive for me to to do data input. Um, 
you know, my hourly rate is a lot higher than my assistant. So I want to make sure that they're able to do the data input. And, you know, so this is something that has to be pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Um, so look for ease of data input. Then I prefer to see financial planning software that's built off of cash flow calculations as opposed to a goals based calculation. And the difference between the two is simply. A goals-based planning, you'll know you're using a goals-based financial planning software if it asks you in advance what you expect the tax rate for the client to be in during retirement. A cash flow-based system doesn't ask you that question. It takes a look at the cash flow that's coming in during retirement and taxes it appropriately. What we've found in our tax system, because we have what's called a marginal tax system, so the more you, the more taxable income you have in Canada, the higher your tax rate is going to be, and the different type of, of income you receive uh, is going to be taxed at different rates. What we find is that if you use the goals-based planning, goals-based simply says, What's, what do you think the average tax rate is going to be? You're overtaxing a client. And so you're, you're uh, in the initial years and undertax them in the latter years. And what that does from a result standpoint is that it, it encourages a client to put aside more money for the future than they actually have to. And I'm a real proponent of um, living for today, but making sure you're putting enough aside for tomorrow so that if you get there, you're going to be you're you're going to have enough to to provide you with a comfortable and and happy retirement but i don't want to put more aside for tomorrow because i may not get there so it's finding that happy balance and so that's why i prefer the cash flow calculation uh as opposed to a goals based calculation and it's very easy to t- tell the two uh, tell between the two simply by whether or not you're you're putting in what the uh, tax rate is for retirement the other thing you're going to look at is your review process so once you've developed a financial plan how are you going to keep that plan updated? And does the software allow you to do that in a simple way? Um, so again, you're going to want to find the software that gives you the simplest review process because really that's where the value is in your financial planning. It's in keeping the plan up to date. One of the biggest reasons why people don't keep their financial plan up to date is because the software they're using is so cumbersome to use that it takes too much time. And as a result, they're not getting paid for that. So uh, in our process, we are getting paid for that because we're charging a a review fee. Uh, So it does compensate you for the time that's going into reviewing the the plan. And uh, you just want to make that process as simple as possible. Again, you want to make it in such a way that an assistant can do it so so other people can prepare your uh, reviews. So you can then spend the time on reviewing the plan as opposed to entering the data for the plan. The one thing that my 20 years has taught me is that financial planning scenarios you spend a lot of time modeling on today will never play out as expected. As a result of this, I focus on explaining to clients what their options are going to be in the future as opposed to modeling specific detailed scenarios. You see, you can get lost in the analysis. What is important to a to, is to present the options that a client will have available to them in the future. You know, if they want to see a specific, uh, you know, a specific rendition of a, of a future, then fine, we can model that for them. But I don't want to say, okay, scenario one is going to be um, retiring at 65 and then living off of an income of X. And then scenario two is going to be retiring at, at 65, selling your house at age 60, and then living off of, you know, a, a retirement income of, you know, all these different scenarios that we, because we, we don't know when they're going to sell their house. We don't, we don't know anything about what's going to happen in the future. But what I want them to realize is what options they have available to them. So uh, that's more around the discussion that I have as opposed to getting lost in the detailed analysis. Um, I want to say, listen, you're on track for this. Keep in mind that, you know, um, when you retire, this is what you've asked for. This is what's attainable. This is what you can accomplish. But keep in mind that, you know, you still have your home available to you, that I haven't used the equity in your home as as uh, uh, an asset that I'm using to, to generate cash flow for you during retirement because you need to live somewhere. But remember, there's always a date that you may you may want to sell your home. And when that happens, that's going to release a lot of capital. So let's keep that in mind that, you know, we do still have the value of your home that we're going to be, uh, that's going to be available to us in the future that we're not factoring into the calculation. So I have discussions with them around that more about about them saying, okay, well, if I sell my house at 63, uh, what's that going to, what's that going to do for me? And because really we don't know what's going to happen, but we, what I can say to them is that you do have this available to you whenever you sell your house. So let's not get lost in the analysis. I do a lot of work with business owners and find that it's helpful to show them 
the importance of liquidity. A lot of business owners have enough net worth to retire, but in practice, they can't retire because their net worth is tied up in their business. So this encourages a great discussion on strategies to support becoming more liquid as time goes on. You see, with business owners, the planning process is actually quite powerful for them because it brings to them uh, an understanding that, you know what, I've got this business, I've got this great cash flow, and I've got this, this great asset. But when you ask them, look, what's the asset worth? Well, it's worth whatever whatever anybody's going to pay for it, but they usually will think it's worth more. So it's kind of it, that asset actually goes into the category of equity that I can't use to live off of unless it's sold. So when I show them, listen, based on your liquid assets right now, this is all the income we can support in retirement. And oftentimes that income is not what they were hoping for. And so as a result of that, it then stimulates a conversation about, well, then let's find ways of getting more liquidity either out of your business or setting up your business in such a way so that we can get it, make it, have it uh, be sold for more when the time comes. So let's focus on business building solutions that are going to create a business that is more in line with um, you not having to be there every single day in order for the business to work. And so these are really interesting conversations. Now, this just happens to be a niche that I work in. Uh, and if you're not working in business owners, then it's not too much of an issue. But it's a niche that I work in that I'm, I have a lot of enjoyment out of because I'm a business owner. I'm constantly trying to build my business uh, so that uh, so that I can have a comfortable retirement um, so I can speak on the same, uh, the same level with them. So anyways, that's just some information from, uh, from my background and, and how I do my planning. So hopefully that answers a lot of your questions. Now, um, I want to thank the following people for reaching out to me with questions, uh, and comments over the past month or so. You know, I just love the questions that come in. And so, you know, Matt N, Niles G, uh, Bob F, uh, Kamal S, Uma K, Mark D, Marco V, uh, Andrew W, Tim L, Curtis M, John E, Terrence R, Gerard K, Barbara S, Daniel H, Jody W, Gail C, Brian M. You know, I love your comments and questions. I've had so much fun answering them along the way. I hope this episode, you know, answers some of the key questions. And by by all means, if you have any other questions along the way, I encourage you to email me them. uh, And I'll do my best to get back to you as quickly as I can. But, uh, you know, it's it's just such a great business to be in. I think it is the best business in the world. Uh, I I feel that the uh, the fee-based financial planning model is, is beginning to gain traction. People are getting around the idea of what it's what's involved with it um as i said in some of the uh, intro information you know i wish i'd had myself to turn to when i was building my practice uh, because there was nobody for me i mean i when i started in this business uh, i remember my my initial uh, branch manager said what are you wasting your time with all this financial planning stuff for that's not where the money is well, I mean, you know, it, he was right at the time. It's, it wasn't where the money was. But you know what? Clients are demanding more. They're not wanting people to sell them products. They're wanting people to advise them. And this is where fee-based financial planning comes from. But if you're not getting compensated for the advice you're providing, you're going to very quickly gravitate to the area of the business which pays you, um, to, which pays you, which is the, the product implementation. And that's what all the investment companies want. But that's not what clients want. Clients want to know you're working with them. And the only way they know for sure is when they pay you for the advice that they're getting. So take take uh, take that for what it's worth. Uh, it's working well for me, extremely well for me. And I think by uh, embracing uh, this type of methodology and going back through some of the previous episodes of the Fee-Based Financial Planning Mastery podcast uh, will really, really help uh, because I'm hoping that uh, all the episodes are just answering some of the niggly little questions that uh, you're not able to get full answers to. Uh, and so hopefully this will help. So anyways, get out there and simply build yourself a better business. You've been listening to Scott E. Plaskett, a certified financial planner and industry veteran in the world of fee-based financial planning. Want free resources to help you build a better fee-based financial planning firm? Visit ilovefinancialplanning.com right now to register for Scott's Inner Circle email list where you'll get front-of-the-line updates on the latest resources that are driving profits to Scott's fee-based financial planning practice. All of the resources are pulled directly from the highly acclaimed fee-based financial Financial Planning Mastery Academy. Go now to ilovefinancialplanning.com. Build a better business and make more money with your fee-based financial planning practice today.